Okay. Um, when I saw the uh, email train this last time, and you know, I brought up in the uh, in the meetings too about what the different things that can be done with the C star, et cetera, et cetera. So I thought, okay, let's have a a Zoom meeting and just to talk about stuff and see what's out there and also to exchange information because it looks like everybody's got a, a, something that's up with it. But let me do something first. I want to share a, a screen of what um, I ran across. And I talked to a couple of guys double at the AAVSO, American Association of Variable Star Observers, and, and just to pick their brain on what's out there as far as um, scientific programs with these sea stars and other smart telescopes. And so on the unistellar end, uh, he steered me, one of the guys steered me to this, where you have the uh, thrill of scientific discovery. And in here, Uh, here we go. Discovery range. Yeah, I got to go back. Well, here we go. So under Explorer, it's citizen science. And they have several programs through Unistellar that they have. Uh, asteroids program, planetary defense, exoplanets, comets, cosmic cataclysms, I thought they were somewhere else in here too. So they have these different programs that you can contribute your images. And here's their, they have a big network so far. And then if there's a, a paper published or a discovery and you're part of it with your images, then you're given credit on the paper and things like that. So that's one area to look at. Yeah, when they organize a lot of these, they're basically, they let you know if you're in the target area and then you get hooked up with a team of people, other volunteers, and you all go after it. That way they've got a lot of people right. looking at the same time in case other people get clouded out and other stuff, you know. Right. They also drain your telescope and you start scratch um, and just work with the images that come out. Then you get the reporting that comes back from all that. And I haven't had the opportunity to do it because I live to live in a sucky, you know, weather area for sure. <laughs> but it's good. That Those was, are good programs. Um, sorry, that, that was one of the things that really attracted me to the Unistellar was the citizen science. Now, I, I didn't buy the Unistellar because I realized the limitations it had on planetary stuff and, and things like that. So, you know, I went with the Celestron C8, um, but I really would like to get involved with citizen science with with the um, with the S50. I hope that's doable. Well, that's the they have to make the arrangements with the scientists, you know, basically here, the people who are working on it, SETI and other other parts of NASA. And apparently the, the couple of the smaller scopes, that's not an issue that they can get it done. Yeah, well, I can guarantee you there's a lot more um, S50s out there in the last six or seven months than there are unistellars in the last two or three years. That's true, but it's a matter of quality and capability. Yeah, yep. So that's one path. The other path is um, on the ZWOC star. 
that AAVSO is working on a software program uh -huh. that they hope to be uh, have it out before the end of this year. And again, the same type of uh, programs around variable stars and the supernova search and things like that to where um, you would send in the images and then they would do all the plate solving, all the magnitude reading and, and, and um, analysis and that. And again, it's like Herman said, you know, they, then they would, would increase their uh, observing numbers. Right. 10 or a hundred fold, you know? Um, and my thought was on that, is it okay? Yeah. If I had one and the night is clear and, and I have a list of things, I just go out there and, and uh, image on the areas, like he said, like you, you can get down to 20th magnitude in a very short time. And then you're taking that data, which is an image, but you're not processing it as an image. It's, it's a statistical of, of the magnitudes of the stars and, and things like that. And if you can imagine like an eclipsing variable over five hours and you take those pictures and send them in, then they can get a, a, a light curve off of it pretty easily. Um, and accurately. When I was doing that kind of stuff visually, uh, you really had to be mentally subjective and and of what you what you are were doing so that when you look at the, the your your star field in the image or in the eyepiece, each time you're not biased by your previous reading of it because you had comparison stars and, the, and then the um, variable star. But it was real easy to to slew your own observing, especially on an eclipsing binary, because that, oh, it changed, it changed. Well, how do you know it changed? It's your eye, right? But this way, um, it'll be an accurate thing with the uh, with the smart telescope. So those are the paths that, that uh, we can go down and, and um, look for the article in the March 2024. Um, I mean, the, um, the April issue about the, the AAVSO analysis of, of some of these. And then, um, you know, look into some of these programs because I think it'll be um, pretty rewarding if you're part of a, a team that makes some kind of discovery or not. The other thing I found out, I did not know this, but in, in the sky is one of them, but you can find out where the James Webb telescope is. And also, because uh, it gives you the right ascension and declination, like here, seven hours, 20 minutes, 50, 55 declination, 1554, 53.2. So put that into your your uh, C star, and it's in Gemini, and here it is uh, right now. And then uh, in the next four hours, it'll be over here. So if you take a picture of this area, over time, uh, the space telescope is going to move and your exposure should be long enough to pick up that magnitude. So that's another cool thing. You can uh, track the James Webb Space Telescope. So so you're you're saying you're actually tracking the physical object? Yes. Or you're looking yeah. at the same stuff that they're looking at? No, no physical the, object. You're, that's the physical telescope moving from here to here. <clears throat> because you know it's always opposite the sun, right? So this is reflecting off the heat, the... Um, Sun shield. So anyway, that was uh, some information from the fellow from AABSO. Interesting stuff. And then in uh, the March 2024, there's a four or five page review by Dennis DeSico on the C-Star S50 smart telescope. So if you look for that, it's pretty in-depth in -depth, uh, review. Okay, so that's the overview of, of my idea of having the, the meeting today. So now I'll, I'll let you guys add it and uh, see what uh, problems you have or the, how it's going well or the different, the different types of uh, smart telescopes. Well, if somebody wants to donate $4,000, I will be happy to get the Celestron, um, I can't remember what it's called now. Origin. Origin, Origin, yeah, because that one looks like 
it was designed with um with actual um astrophotography in mind uh, this is a six inch rasa jack will yeah. be in the mail first thing tomorrow yeah six inch yeah. <clears throat> i've used the the 11 inch and it's that's a remarkable device you know but uh, 11 inch ra rasa yeah but, uh, yeah some serious light gathering and the fact after that you can hearing, after hearing Mark talk about the collimation complications with uh, those uh, catadioptric uh, RASA systems, I don't think I uh, I'm ready to deal with something like that. Somebody well, who knows more, please explain. If you look at this Celestron, it's basically just cobbled together stuff that it's already got there. It's got that has me worried because when they cobble stuff together, it's like, okay, somebody did this, somebody's in charge of that, somebody's in charge of this, and God knows if it ever works. It is oh, a nice looking scope. The RASA uh, that Mark Christensen talks about. And it isn't just that, it's the, uh, it's the optics. It's, it's a pair of hyperbolic ground mirrors or one spherical and one hyperbolic. And the dimensions between the two and the alignment of them is super critical to get the performance that they promise. And if it's a little bit off, uh, it's very difficult. You need special equipment to get it right. Now I was reading this, and they say that they include whatever you need to re to recollimate it, but it's not a simple collimation like we do on our C8s or C6s. No, it's not. And it's but it's a this... very precise collimation job. So as long as you don't donk it, you know you'll be fine. Um. I misunderstood. My understanding of a RASA is there's only one mirror. And then there there's is. the camera where the secondary mirror would be. Right. That's correct. Yeah. So the, the idea is how sturdy is it and how much of a bounce around can it take? This thing looks pretty sturdy. but So this is the camera here, right? Yeah. Here's your 2.2 yeah. mirror. Oh really? Right now, see now, I didn't know this. I thought, uh, yeah, somebody who knows what they're talking about, please step in. Yeah, the 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 uh, the mirrors in the back, like a normal telescope, and it goes straight to the camera. So here's the. So all the correction is in that faceplate. Right. Up here. Yeah. Not, so here it is, it's uh, uh, six inch 2.2 .2 optics. Yeah. I thought the R stood for Richie or something. Maybe it, what is, what does RASA stand for? Right here. Roe Ackerman Schmidt Astrograph. Okay, well, I'm going to have to look that up. Excuse me. So there must be upstream of the camera, there must be something, uh, um, some type of, of mirror because they just showed the focusing part is in the back, like a standard. Um, yeah. So go, about, go down a little bit there. A little bit farther. Or maybe go up a little bit farther. I don't know. That's yeah, right the mirror. There, right okay, there where there. the diagram is. Yeah, go back. Down a little bit. Down, down, right there. There, there. Oh, there it is. That's yeah. your mirror. So that's that, your mirror. if that's your focusing motor. Sign out. Click on restart. It, I mean, that right there looks like a, looks like a Schmidt Cassegrain. Was this helpful? It is. Please let us know in the comment section below. For more information, please visit the link Am in I the description that? section. If this was helpful, please subscribe to our channel. Anyway.
what they've got, what they're showing here is they've got the mirror driven for focus. Yes. Okay. Yes. And it's also controlled so that it can't get out of collimation. So my question is about it's this. It's self-collimating, apparently. Yeah. So my question is, why have the optical tube here? Where? If you don't have a secondary mirror, nothing that was ever going to get to that optical tube. What, what are you talking about? Right, right here. Go click on that again, Mark. Okay. Right in the middle of the mirror is this tube where on a Schmidt Cassegrain, the actual image travels down that tube to the optical back, right? Whatever you have back there. This one doesn't have a camera back here in the back. It has a camera in the front. So what's yeah. that <laughs> optical tube doing there? Why isn't it just a mirror? I think they have here about do control. They said something. Well, I think uh, I think maybe what they're doing is that it's actually controlling the aim for the camera chip. Making That's what sure I'm wondering. That, yeah, which would mean you sure would, that it's... which would mean that you that the camera had would have to have uh, at least a partially silvered mirror in front of it for that to work. Don't know. Here's, a, some, here's know something either. about do heating, the do heater. Yeah. Yeah, it's got the built-in do heater and the um and the part that um that regulates it. You don't have to buy any of that. And then here's the to then you have a do shield integrated up front to then minimize stray light. So that's what the, the tube yeah. looks like. Yeah, right? so it ha it does have the do shield the shield built in. But all of them, the, this one looks the most like the kind of a thing an astrophotographer would use, you know. <laughs> but and, like it, and it's um, it's upgradable too. Mm -hmm. You can take that back box off of it, and and swap out the camera for a new camera. Um, the the CPU is a uh, Raspberry Pi four, so that could be upgraded as well. So it's it's um it's upgradable, which none of the others offer. They're all a single package. All right, I just looked it up. That camera in the front that's hanging on the corrector plate. Yeah. There's there's a four element corrector lens in there. Right there. That thing right there. In in the black box to uh, the black cylinder. To the left of the word Celestron, all of that right there is a four element corrector lens. It corrects the, I presume, and I haven't read that far on, on the, the design. It's a, probably a spherical mirror. Uh, I don't know about the corrector plate, whether it's just a flat piece of glass or whether it's a, um, a Celestron uh, Schmidt uh, mirror. Uh, it's probably Schmidt, yeah. It's got a Schmidt it corrector is. plate. It's got yeah. a spherical mirror in the back. And to correct for the um, the sh very short F number, they have a four element lens to flatten out that field and do whatever is optically necessary to give you a good image. Yeah, to cover the to my eye, that looks a lot like that thing you used to buy for uh, retrofitting a C8 from Arizona, you know, that uh, uh, I, uh, there's a astronomy place that manufactures add-ons. Yeah. yeah, you can still get that. You can yeah, still okay. get it. I think that's what it is. It's probably something like that, but maybe it's proprietary and it's a little bit better. That's all I know right now. I'm going to go read this after we're done. Well, they've got it. They've had the, the, uh, the RASAs out for many years. And... Uh, so this is 
a proven technology for them. They've been out what eight close to eight years now. <clears throat> Just they can never afford them. They can rent time on them. I love the filter drawer in that thing. Yeah. There, by the way, if you've got an S25 um, and you have a 3D printer, um, I'm looking at you, Bob, because you seem to be able to buy all these things. <laughs> um, uh, they they have um they have 3D um designs for both filter holders and for dew shields for the um S50. And, and they promise that, that you'll be able to buy them within a few months. Okay. You can get them uh, online I, right now. You yeah, I send me the STK file and I'll print it. Yeah. So you do have a printer. <laughs> I will send you that STK file. Where do you My think that his Veonis came from? He printed it. I don't know if you can see this, but I can was, see it. Yeah, this is this is for my Veonis. Nice. And I've been looking for what you just described because I'm seriously considering getting a, a C Star. So I I it's on um I will send it to you. Um there's a face there's a C Star Facebook group and uh it was it was put on there. Um at least the the dew shield was put on there. Um, I'll look and see if there's a filter adapter as well. Because both of those, there's there's people out there who are using um, paper towel holders um, as That's a dew toilet shields. paper holder. A to toilet, toilet <laughs> paper. Either, either one. It has to be two inches. So <laughs> it has to have a two inch. Uh, I, I used one uh, of those once. It's, it's, it's not optimal. <laughs> yeah. And what's I, I'm not I'm not familiar enough with the optics to understand why it can't be any longer than seven and a half millimeters or seven and a half centimeters. It's something about one point five times the the um, the diameter of the aperture. If you go longer than that, then you affect. Well, if the, you think um, about it, just just visualize your field of view. It spreads out mm -hmm. like a cone. And if you have a 24-inch yeah. long uh, paper towel tube, it's going to cut off the outside of that cone. But so you have to have it shorter than so it doesn't cut off the cone. Okay, so, but from a, from a physics standpoint, you would want to collimate as much light as you could before it reached the lens because all you want entering the lens is planar waves to begin with correct and so you don't want something coming in at any angle at all remember you only want it from coming a in straight on remember from a physics pr perspective that thing is so far away every ray of light comes in is is exactly. correct exactly and that's and that's my point so what does it matter i it seems like i could have a 30 foot long tube and it wouldn't matter because everything's planar it, wave. It doesn't matter for the stars you can still see. You're just blocking out the, the planar coordinated star wave, starlight that's coming in from an angle. Which is what I don't want anyway. That's, no, that that's is called what you noise. want because there's light <laughs> coming in from, from 10 degrees off center. But okay. the waves coming in from that 10 degrees off center our planar plane waves. That's true. That's true. So if they're coming in from 30 degrees off center, they are still planar polarized. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. From a from a physics point of view. Yeah. Okay. However, that street light down the street. <laughs> I want to block that. Yeah, he's <laughs> he's not planar yet. Yeah. You'll know, you'll have to be standing on that star or on a planet by that star to get that street light planar polarized or yeah. not polarized, but, you know, planar, planar, 
planer. Yeah. Okay. Makes a little, yeah, yeah. I'd like to, I'd like to see, I'm actually going to try and see what happens with a longer one. Vignette, simple as that. The light from that 30 degree off star, still going to get in there, but not as bright. Until it's so dim, your, your sensor doesn't pick it up. Okay. Think All right. about it. And then you got to balance your scope anyway because of that thing sticking out there for four feet. Well, yeah. one of the one of the real well, physical if problems. If it's a toilet paper roll, then you don't need to do that much balancing. <laughs> one of the real physical problems is when these things automatically close up. That that toilet paper roll yes. jams up the works. Yes. So this one, this one is designed to fall off, mm -hmm. and when it gets to this position sunk it hits the ground yeah you ought to market that one for the i am mean, folks no this is this is from a uh, th i didn't make this i mean oh, i didn't I thought you did I thought well you did. i made it but i didn't design it i got a, okay. a, a stx file okay. from just from uh somewhere on uh maker maker bot site or one of those yeah. thing think from thingiverse that's where you get this and i'd like to find the source for the S50 uh, thing, because I'm certain, I'm honestly, I'm thinking about going down to the hobby. We got a hobby store right here in Batavia. And I'm thinking about just getting a sheet of, of PVC plastic, you know, 16th inch thick or less, cutting it to the proper shape of the face of any of these telescopes, cutting a, a 50 millimeter hole in it, and then buying a, a two inch diameter PVC tube, so, and and my current issue is trying to figure a reliable way of attaching it that will fall off at the appropriate time. Velcro is too reliable. Magnets might work, but I got to, you know, I've, I've got to make a, a a flipper that when it closes, it tips the magnet away. You know, you can have a, they make uh table saw gates that are magnetic with a magnet that's a 200 pound pull it won't move but there's a little lever like vice grips that you, you tip the lever and the magnet just comes loose right away if i can dream up something like that to tip it off when it closes up i think I, that's something i'd got it uh, i i patent but right now hey this is good enough and by the way this guy comes with this is threaded in there. You can you can, you can, 3D print threads on the inside of this thing. And, they, and the companion to this piece is a filter holder for non-Veonis uh, filters, you know, Brand X filters, that you can thread into this thing uh, in front of the lens. I didn't print that, but... Uh, Oh, by the way, this thing costs uh, like eight dollars because they weigh it when it's done and they charge you by the ounce. So that was eight eight dollars worth of plastic, and they they make it for me and uh, I don't know overnight really. I'm about to put the link up here, um, in the chat. I can find the chat. There it is. Okay, so that's to my drive, um, which it, I'm allowing anybody to look at that who has the link. So if you want to take that link, um, you can download it. And that's a zip file that um, has all the... Um, the appropriate files for printing out some stuff for the for the um c star okay we're not seeing it am i doing something wrong i'm not i've got it on the right hand part of the screen it should be allowing uh, share well you have to you have to open up chat yeah go down to the bottom and open chat it comes up on the right hand side of the screen yeah
Did you get it, Bob? Bob, you're muted. Oh, there's chat. Okay, yeah, it's on chat. You're still on... muted. Hey, Tom, can you do that on a share screen? On a what? Share your screen with that link. Well, I can, I can put it up there again. Right, it's on chat, but can you do it on the, because I'm allowing more than one person you to just, share. All screen. you have to do is click on that link. You can even copy that link. Right. You can either click on it and they'll take you right there, or you can copy it. For later use. Okay, I'm not sure that the, it records the chat when we record it. Oh, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. You want it. Um, if you record this, it should be also recording the chat. At least that's the way it used to work back when I used to do this as a teacher every day for a year. Okay. And you're a very okay. brave, brave I'm, person I'm, for doing that. I'm back. Um, it took me out of Zoom, and I, I'm confused as to where I went, but I'm back, and I'm simply going to copy your your link. Copy it. There we go. You can just click on it. If you click on it, it will. It should download the zip file. It took me out of the Zoom. And I couldn't find my way back. That's okay. Duh, damn technology. <laughs> so that's the link right there. Okay, yeah. I have. So I you, have the link. You click on that. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say I have the link and I'll take care of it offline. Okay. I highly recommend um, if you're on Facebook, joining this group because there's a lot of good um, info that gets put out there. There's workflows that people put out there. There's there's all sorts of stuff that, um, that people- What's the name of that sharing. group? Hmm? What's the name of that group? I, I'm already a member um, of a C Star Group. What's the name of yours? This is called C Star S50 Official ZWO Group. And in fact, at first I didn't think it was the official ZWO group, but in fact it is. The originator of it is somebody at ZWO. Okay, I've got it. Okay, good. Just join. I ordered a steam sire, but it hasn't arrived. I, I waited a year and a half for my Vionis, right? Yeah. That's the way it well, works. There... I, I would, um, like I told somebody else today, I would recommend getting it from High Point because if it's dead on arrival, you can send it right back to High Point. 
Um, the one problem I hear from people is is getting stuff to and from China can be rather um, stressful. So yeah. don't deal France with isn't it. any better. And I, I bought mine that. at high point. I bought mine at high point. So yeah, I bought mine at high point. Absolutely, buy it from a place around here. Well, let them deal plus, with China. High point, was a, high point was able to give me a, an actual date. The others were just saying soon. <laughs> yeah, and high soon point wasn't was uh, for me. <laughs> high point was straight up for me too. Yeah, you know, I, I'll tell you what. Uh, your telescope was going to show up just before my check for four thousand dollars. <laughs> Well, if you get it, you better bring it to the next um, star party. Oh, I'll get it to you very soon after that. <laughs> soon, my friend, soon. Soon, soon. Ephemerably soon. <laughs> soon, little Smurf, very soon. So what is your guys' opinion that um, this technology is going to leap over each other and those that... Uh, we're early on are going to say, uh oh, I should have waited, or you know, is this stuff gonna be upgradable or well I had a uh, I got my little unistellar EV scope uh about three years ago and the software updates have pretty much kept it up to date. The rest of the sure, thing is sure basically be stayed questions. the same. You know, when you have it at a star party, people are going to ask a lot of questions about it. Yeah. And that's my curiosity about it. It seems like, okay, these things came out, and then all of a sudden, Celestron's got something. Now, the, well, like, you know, all of a sudden, so the next guy's going to have one. The next guy's going to have one. But, and but it's that's like the ZWO. Nature. It's like they keep issuing cameras that outdo the one they did before, and they have the iPhone uh, marketing strategy, you know, just make it better. Do you remember did another one. Detroit in the 60s? Pardon me? Detroit in the 60s. Yeah. Every year you yes. got to get the new model. Oh, there's Only yeah, they Mustang. called it planned obsolescence then. Yeah. Actually, Volkswagen invented planned Carol. obsolescence. So yeah, they, we'll were, they were never. These, right? So they'll last you about three years, maybe. And then you'll have a new, new iteration from that manufacturer with some. Uh, better hardware or some better optics in it. I think it's happening quicker than that. I'm going on record to say that very soon there's going to be something that wipes all these and leaves them in the dust. Yeah. Well, that's what I that's how I'm feeling about the um the Celestron is it's going to leave them all in the dust. It's um it's got a way better resolution um which, than which... than the others do. Well, I mean the 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 C star has a better resolution than the Unistellar that I was thinking of buying a year and a half ago for three thousand dollars. The big so, thing that I, that you guys are all forgetting is that this is no longer about optics; it's about software. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, this thing behind me is Unistellar, and I still haven't got one anything as good out of my C star. Yeah, yeah. Without I, using I've never had, yeah, I've never had the pleasure of using a Unistellar before, so I can't answer one way or another. Yeah, just still working on it. it and I, you know, it's the difference. You know, the, for me, for going out and showing people. If you have to wait two hours for a decent exposure, you've lost your audience. Mm -hmm. And if I can get it in five, seven minutes, then I there they go, gee whiz, I can see color and that's the Orion thing and blah, blah, blah. But if I had to wait 30, 40 minutes to get a basic image, which I have yeah. to do with the C star. And after it's three not images... a usable thing for for you know. To well, me, after... you've got a yeah, you've got a four inch mirror on the Unistella, right? That's right. Yeah, for good reason. So... Yeah, and it was for you know I did it for outreach, not for being the astronomer of the the year, you know. So, 
That's what I said. It I, seems I, like I personally did long. it because. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I'm done. Yeah. It's, uh... Um, I personally did it because it was fun and it had a low price point. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> those those kind of mesh together for me. <laughs> yes, and, and my my motivation would be the the uh, citizen science type thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. where you have you have a variable star or supernova or whatever it is, you know, oh. a near Earth object type thing. You know, uh, it, because of the ease of setting it up. You could do it every clear night that you're at home or whatever. You're available. And and like we talked before, it wouldn't take an hour and a half to set up the rig and cool it down and do dark frames and then do all the processing afterward, which is a separate part of the of the hobby, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But this, that's yeah. why when I was looking at you guys uh, out at the star parties and stuff, and then when uh, Tom did his demo at, last month, those are the types of things that went into my personal desire. If I ever got one of these, that's what I would use it for. Yeah. Because yeah, that's, that's I go what to the I back to use it one for more too. thing, I like the outreach thing with the uh, Revolution Imager. I think I could see what that is. It would be good for now is the um, the local um, Wi-Fi thing. At yeah. the, the, as star parties, that's that's what I would use. That's what I'm going to use the revolution imager for that type of thing. Yeah, like I said, the unit unistellar you can connect up to 14 people yeah. with it, and then your little kids, have, and then they get the pictures on the phone. Right. right. This is their picture from that point on. This is their image, yep. and, and right. it's all the description is there, so they're all excited. But the rest of these guys are like, "What?" Yep. <clears throat> so another thing to consider is the audience. Uh, there are images that you put up on the wall that are four, 16 by 20 of great of Nebula and Orion. But for the most part, what we're doing is we're looking at the output on a 12 inch by 10 inch computer screen or even smaller on a phone. And a two inch aperture gives you all the resolution and contrast you need for a picture that you can hold in for a snapshot really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you want to do a, a 16 by 20, you're going to need a C8 with with an uh, equatorial mount and all the trappings that we know. But if you just want to produce a nice little picture that you can hand out to people or that that people will go, oh, so that's astronomy. <clears throat> the, these little guys are really automatic and are just about appropriate for that. I, I'm not fooling myself. I'm not taking any great pictures with what right. I got, but I'm taking pictures that'll show up and look pretty good on on a, on a computer screen. They don't look so good when they're shown up in front of the club on that big TV set, but you know, say will be. Yeah, I I still plan on. Um... When we have more clear nights, I have um, a, what should be a fairly decent deep sky camera, and putting that onto my um, onto my C8 and trying it out and seeing what I can get, and then playing with it more. But there's also just the beauty of being able to, you know, take two minutes, set this thing up outside, and um, start taking pictures from inside. <laughs> when it was zero degrees outside, I was taking some really fun shots inside, you yeah. know, and- Yeah, like just the, the fun thing is, like I said, the, if you just wanna do observing, how fast can you get to an image that is mm -hmm. a really good image for observing? And if it takes you 20 minutes to get there, 30 minutes to get there, that's not necessarily a good observing image time frame, but five or seven minutes when, when you know the larger ones start up in five minutes and you got yourself an image that yeah I I couldn't do that with my eyes to save my life and the sea star you start getting that but it takes a long time to actually develop the image. I've had people fine. come up to me and and yeah. and see within a minute uh, something recognizable. Something yeah. better than you would see through an eyepiece of a genuine right. telescope. 
and they come back 10 minutes later to see it has developed. That's right. And then they come back again and see how it's come along and they watch it happening. That's something else they can learn. Yeah. No eating during the meeting, please. Oh, no. <laughs> No, no speaking while eating. <laughs> okay, oh my not God. eating. He fell off the moon. <laughs> no, so that might said my driver was I liked I wanted to replace observing by fast imaging. Okay. I, and so I was looking at stuff I had never seen through a telescope in five, seven minutes with the Unistellar. I'm still waiting for something else that can give me that kind of thing without going to an hour for everything, hour and a half, stuff like that. I've got people, you know, I'm, I'm on most of these groups. I did five hours last night to skip this. Well, why would you? Are you crazy? It's an, it's not a good image in five hours. It's better, but it's not something you would, like you said, hang on the wall. It never will be, unless you use Pix and Sight, and it'll make up one for you. <clears throat> it'll just give you the image you want. But, um, that, that's the reason I, I did it for fast observing and I was just so thrilled because I could see things that I never really ever got to see through a telescope in five or seven or ten minutes and, and with the weather cool. the way we have it these days I've been able to get out there when a cloud bank was coming get some time in yeah, and then bring it back in when, when it could cloud right. it up but right. I had something in that in that 15 mate well it's probably been an hour but in one hour i can get something out and in and half the time i would spend half that time setting up my uh my celestra and i'll go back to, one I'll of the things that I've noticed... it, but that's but that would be my motivation then if i had one of these i'd be doing the scientific thing and yeah okay there's two hours right after sunset i can get six variable star fields in there and, and you know that's the that's what my motivation would be yeah because like by the other way, night it was it got it got uh lousy around 8 39 o'clock by my house but there was two hours that you could have done something yeah. but it sure wasn't worth setting up my whole rig for that because i wouldn't get anything out of it with the you wake up in the middle of the night and go hey it cleared up you can you can put the telescope yep. out, sit in your underwear by the by the kitchen table and, and take pictures. Yeah. Just don't set it up in your underwear so you're gonna freeze your possessions. We didn't like that visual image there. Yeah, I can't get that out of my mind now. I can't unthink that. <laughs> I don't wear underwear to bed. Oh my god. That's even worse. That's even worse. <laughs> I'm imagining a robe now. Okay, just a robe. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll, the, um, we'll, we'll we'll buy you a robe, uh, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> a sea star robe. <laughs> yeah, with the uh, yeah the sea star logo on it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I think the sea star is probably the one of the better ones out there. For, for, you know, for the money, you can't be beat. Oh no, the, the, oh, for sure. Yeah, but, uh, to add in there, since it's so small, it has its own case. Ease of taking it on an airplane with you. Because oh, I yeah. surely would not want to take my uh, my SCT on an airplane. No, it it'll come out no. more pieces than it went in. But yeah, throw this no, in I... a decent sized backpack. Throw it in the overhead. It's good. That's one of the reasons even, why I went for even... this Hestia new thing. It uh, it's the size of a book, hardback book. Yep. You lay a you lay a. Uh, an, an iPhone on it, and uh, it, it's it's basically a telephoto lens. That uh, what is that? It's my dwarf. Ah, yes. Okay. I'm thrilled with that. And you, that one you can put on an airplane in case like this. You know, nothing there. So, but uh, that who has its that? advantages. Who is, who it's, makes it's, that one, uh, Herman? Dwarf. Dwarf Labs. Dwarf Labs, okay. Yeah, cost four nine four ninety something like that. 
So which one is your favorite? Because you have the Unistellar. I like the Unistellar. Star. I like okay. the Unistellar. Uh, the Dwarf is getting new software, and the new software has made enormous improvements. It it seemed more like using a a, a real telescope because you had to set the focus. You had you had to set a lot of stuff in there. Now it just does the major stuff, but it gives it easier ways to, to do it. So they've been dumping. They've been much slower in giving software changes. This last one is going to make it more usable. I, I've got it because uh, it's a wide angle thing. It's it's just it's a it's a huge wide angle, so you can get all of Andromeda and all of the surrounding things in one shot. You can get the mark and chain chain in one shot, that kind of stuff. So no, you don't need mosaics. And it's so small and easy to use. How how wide is it? How many degrees is it? I just don't remember. I just know that you can get the entire. Get all of, no, huh? Yeah, if you can get all of Andromeda, that's at least three degrees. Yeah, that's nice. That's very nice. And it also does the rest landscapes, terrestrial stuff. You know. But, uh, so that's a good, it's again, it's a small thing, but uh, it, it works. The question for people that have the C star with the latest firmware, have has anybody done 20 second imaging, 20 second exposures? Not yes. yet. Wait, there was a yes. How did that turn out? Um, didn't really notice the difference. I'm pretty certain that um, C-Star uh, syncs, I mean, I use 10 seconds for the most mm -hmm. part. Right. Um, because I, I just haven't had, I haven't started taking an image and said to myself, wow, if only I was getting three photons on that pixel instead of only two, you know, I it, it always starts just showing up right away, right? And maybe I'm right. just taking the easy things, but, um, but it, it didn't it didn't seem any different to me taking 20 second um, subs instead of 10. And okay. I didn't notice any difference um, in the output. Okay. How about Those sensors are back illuminated and they have almost no okay. noise. And last thing, how anybody done planetary with it? With the zooms, I all have. the planets went away before I got mine, <laughs> and then it's been. I could have caught Saturn, but it was too cloudy. Okay, I've done. I've done Jupiter, Uranus, and Saturn, and they look the same. They're just a different color. They're they're one pixel. Really? Okay. With your, oh, you with it, but you have what you've got the Vespa. Yeah, I've got the Vespera. It's a uh, 200 millimeter focal length. So the, the image is, is it, the, Jupiter is maybe three pixels. And you can definitely tell that it's Jupiter by the color. And the same thing is true for Saturn. And Uranus is also kind of a bluish tint. But I could have changed it to green if I wanted in post. NASA did. So yeah, well, these short focal lengths are not good for planetary at all. No. Well, I and, did a and... video of, of Jupiter before the zoom feature was out. And after I post-processed it, I mean, you can see some color bands. Yeah, uh, it's... I mean, I it's see... not like a real telescope, obviously. But, no. You know, it did get well, some it's positive definitely not intended when I showed it to people. It's not intended to be a planetary camera, and, and no. they say so in the ads. So we have Unistellar, Dwarf, and Sea Star. Are there any other? Vespera. What Vespera. is it again? V E S P E R A. Yep. Okay. 
And then Celestron, of course. Yeah. So it's quite an exciting thing that's going on. The, the, the race between all of the companies to come up with some some solutions. And I think we're living in good times because I just Please. I just got an ad that I, I could get myself a, a, a 778 millimeter, 180 millimeter refractor came in my my uh, astronomy magazine. All I needed to do was pay eighteen thousand five hundred dollars for it. Okay, so it's it's an <laughs> investment. Yeah, yeah, I got 178 sitting out in the observatory, but eighteen thousand five hundred dollars for a refractor, just to, you know. You, you know the thing it, that's you know, driving the the uh, the thing right now is is Sony because they're the ones that have the the back illuminated sensors. Oh yeah. yeah. There's there's a APS-C and a full frame back illuminated. The full frame comes in at around seven thousand bucks, just for the sensor. So you add the camera, wrap that around it, and you're talking from ZWO something in the, of 10, 10 grand. And the same thing for the APS-C, that guy comes in at five grand because the the sensor itself from Sony costs you know four three four thousand dollars. The chips that we're working on are like one thirty, you know, six millimeters, six millimeters diagonal, and you know some of them are CinemaScope and some of them are square. But there's only about three. There's the 585 and the 485 and a couple of other ones that are even smaller. Those guys are the ones that are driving these little bitty telescopes because the signal to noise ratio is so good. They are so sensitive because of that back illumination. They're, they're like double a, a full decibel better uh, or more than the ones that are previous, you know, the previous technology. When you see Sony coming out with another chip, the 685 or 885 or whatever the next number is going to be, where it's a little bit bigger format and they can go to a longer focal length, that's when you'll see it show up in that in that Celestron telescope. Because right now that telescope is overdrive for that little bitty chip. But I read somewhere that that camera in the back of it or in the front of it, wherever it is, is replaceable. You can use that telescope and change the camera up front. And of course, the software, you just download some more software, you know, and they've got all the software infrastructure with their little bitty boards and their motors and things like that. And probably they've got in the works an equatorial mount coming. And when you get an equatorial mount and the ability to track and all that other stuff that they're talking about in their other telescopes, You'll be able to do one minute exposures with the super chip. And that's yeah, all I got uh, to say about that. The small the, the dwarf can be aimed at the North Star and it'll track because it just turns itself. So you basically, as soon as you polar align it, it, it runs like a regular telescope. You can do more. Yeah, and, and that's they, the downside to these sea stars is that you can mount them. I guess they can take the strain of being mounted at 45 degrees without ruining the bearings or the stripping the gears, but they can't go to the southern latitude, go below the, equ the equator, the celestial equator. So they're yep. just not designed to do that because they're yep. they're at alt as mount. Once that gets overcome, then we're going to have uh, equatorial. Uh, and I didn't know that about the the, the dwarf. I, I do remember seeing that the dwarf can do a lot of things that these other guys can't, simply yeah, because could... of its optical train. Yeah. I'd like to see him come up with a bigger version of that. Well, that would defeat their purpose of having a small version. <laughs> What's their purpose? I thought their purpose was to sell more telescopes and make more money. I don't know. They're Chinese. What do I know? 
I've sit, I've sat through many of their live broadcasts from China at four o'clock in the morning explaining stuff that I say. What do I know? <laughs> you're all funny, you're cute, you smile, but I don't, you know. But in the back, they've got their little thing up there on, a, on an angle so it can track easily, you know, and I've got a, my tripod I use it on is basically I aim it on that and just let it sit and go. Yeah, the trick to those things is you just tell them you're at the North Pole and mount it on a on a equatorial wedge. Yeah. And it'll do that. It just yeah. won't point to anything below the horizon. So I have one more question about these. So how do they stack up because your your exposures are short? I mean, you're sitting in light polluted skies here in Chicago area. I mean, they take into account that with all of this. Well, one of the things that you have to remember is if you're in a light polluted sky, you really can't take much more than a 30 or, or 40 second exposure without having your black level come up. Right. It's simply because of the light pollution that you're seeing. I understand it, but see, right. And that's that's the question I'm asking. The C Star when... has a light pollution filter you can select. Okay. Uh, that's yeah. actually built in. Yeah. And uh, the others, you can put filters on them, regular, your yeah. own filter on the damn things. Like the Equinox has a little thing that screws in the front, and you can put any kind of filter on it you want. But, uh, so C Star's um, LP, from what I've seen, Mark, is pretty close to the uh, UHC yeah. that uh, you and I both have. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just for light pollution, it's also for um, for uh, nebula as well. Yeah. In fact, if you're pointing at a nebula, if you select a nebula from the from the um, from the screen, it'll automatically put it in. It'll automatically put in the the filter. Okay. See, those are the nice features that are coming out more and more for these things. Automatically picking the proper filter. Automatically not looking at the sun. Yeah. Yeah. It 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 will it will not go into sun mode until you tell it that you put the solar filter on the front. Now you don't have that. to put the solar filter on the front. You can go ahead and burn out that chip. Mine has a sensor on the the filter itself, the filter holder that okay. says, I am a solar filter and I'm in place. And it won't point okay. at the sun unless that thing, you can knock the glass out of it if you want. Yeah. And burn, burn stuff up. But it, it does provide, it is more foolproof than what you just described. Yeah, you have to, the, the solar filter is the one filter on the Sea Star that you have to put in. The other filters, and, and there's only two other internal filters. There's the, there's the dark filter that it uses for its darks, and then there's the UHC that it uses for light pollution and, and nebula. The dark the dark filter is nothing more than a than a black shutter piece, a, a shutter yeah, yeah. and okay. and I I did some darks on my Veonis before they added that feature, but simply by putting a handkerchief over the lens, and and letting it take a few exposures, because my Veonis has at least fifty hot pixels. Yeah. So if oh, someone... by the way, on this the Celestron camera is uh, a couple generations old on that telescope, so they probably will be providing a newer version when, if and when they they get their mm -hmm. hands on it. But they're selling it with at least a one generation old. Uh, I, I looked up the the description of it, and it is not one of those back illuminated sensors. Right. <clears throat> And how, which one, or how do you get a wide field on any of these? Like if you wanted to mosaic, take mosaic. Like a Milky Way picture or something like that. Mosaic. Okay. That's one of the big things with the Veonis that, that uh, 
uh, it automatically can take a a, a, a mosaic and it automatically, it, it takes the center of the mosaic first, and then it begins to do what you would do, which is just map out the surrounding area and then start taking those pictures around and around. And it gives you a display of how many uh, surrounding uh, mosaic images it's, it has collected. And it stacks them in real time. And you can actually see the picture getting bigger and bigger as it paints the perimeter and I, and that's a fantastic thing uh and it stacks them internally uh the only stacking program that's external to that thing that'll handle those bits files from that stacking is a uh, deep sky stacker and it's only version five of deep sky stacker uh because prior to that the older versions would would just You'd have to do contortions to get it to to go outside of the original boundaries. So that's really good, but this meeting is about the sea star. So, um, Tom, I was just uh, re-reviewing your picture of M51, and that thing is really fantastic. So, what uh, did, did you just point it at M51 and take 90 minutes worth of data? or but yeah so um i was kind of wanting to do that because i can't remember who it was whether it was you or bob or somebody threw down the gauntlet at the last meeting well what would it do with m51 so uh sunday was was very clear out here and um friday and saturday started off clear but then fog came in like around eight or nine o'clock well in, in my backyard, M51 doesn't come above the houses and trees until about uh, 10, 30 or 11. So I started on that probably about 11, 30 and ran until one. And um, and it stayed crystal clear. And uh, yeah, that, that, was, that was actually a fun one. I was tired the next day. <laughs> it was Monday and I wasn't willing to get out of bed. <laughs> Do you have yeah. um, Photoshop? I did not do anything. There is no post processing. Yeah, I, I understand, but do you have Photoshop? I do. I have PaintShop Pro. How about GIMP? How about what? GIMP. GIMP is freeware, isn't it? Yeah, and it does everything Photoshop yeah. does. If you can find well, it, I, the, the, yeah, the, the I options that is. I don't have GIMP. All right, because I don't, when I don't I was... have anything, and I and. Quite honestly, um, like with the with the imaging um, group and having the meetings, I would like that's what I was going to request for our next meeting is that I, I understand how how easy this stuff is to do if you have PixInsight and all the add-ons for PixInsight. Uh, but well, but I don't have five hundred dollars worth of software. What I was going to suggest <laughs> is not Pix Insight. All I think you need to do on that image is uh, maybe despeckling would work. If you don't have um, like uh, money to buy a gazillion of these different add-on programs, and you have Photoshop, there might be an option in Photoshop to despeckle. And that can remove some of the noise that you see when, when you blow up the background a little bit mm -hmm. of your image. You can see the, the dots all over the place. Yeah, yeah. But it's yes. like a perfect a perfect image of M51 <clears throat> yeah. surrounded it's by a background. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's so... actually the new the new C-Star, the, the latest version of C-Star um, has, you have to do it on the telescope itself. It has um, a denoise and a saturation and and some a couple other things that you can do for post processing to an image. And I I have not had the time um, to go through it and see you know this is this is where I did the denoising and this is where I didn't do the denoising and can I see the difference and. And does it take away from the from the image quality yeah. and resolution and stuff like that? I haven't done that yet. I think if you take that picture, that C star picture of M fifty one that you sent to us, 
-hmm. And I would send it to both Sky and Telescope and Astronomy Magazine since the sea star is the new like buzzword thing and um, probably wouldn't even clean it up. Just send it like right out of the camera and that might you be- would send uh, it to who? Astronomy Magazine, for, the, the for photo Sky gallery. And <clears throat> the Sky and Telescope, yeah. Um, both of them actually. And I don't think you even need to be a subscriber to do that. I think uh, you, any, they, they've got an email address in there. You can go to OSCO and pick up an astronomy magazine or Sky and Telescope. So you don't have to be a subscriber to uh, email them or anything. And um, since the Sea Star is the new hot thing, I wouldn't be surprised, especially if you do a letter to the editor and say, um, like if they ever put a recent article in about the Sea Star or EAA, you're saying, oh, this is what I did with my experiment with EAA, and your article inspired me to do this. That so they're just like, say something about their article. Let's suck up and, a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And um, boom, you, you're, you've got a great picture, and it's going to be in either Sky and Telescope or Astronomy. Yeah. Well, it's, some, a good, it's a good else. enough picture. Yeah. Somebody else. It is. I, I agree. Uh, with it. On the on the S fifty uh, Facebook group, somebody else took the nearly at the same night. They took nearly identical parameters for their picture, but then they use PixInsight, and so it's all these great colors are blasting out of it. You know, so they use the fits, which it's automatically taking, and and then they you know, uh, stacked it themselves, which I've done, but then I don't have anything for post-processing after the stacking. Yeah. And so, um, so yeah. theirs looks, looks like something that you could put on a wall where mine just looks like a really good picture of M51. But the point <laughs> is, That's I think. That's the point. Yours is clean. Yeah. Well, no one, yeah. when, when, when someone is looking to buy a telescope like that, I personally would not be interested in what somebody could do with Pix Insight. I'd be interested in what exactly is coming out of the camera, and that's what your image perfectly shows. Anybody yeah. can load it in um, Photoshop, Pix Insight, and get a, a equally decent image. I'm going to argue, and it'll um, look good in a magazine uh, thumbnail. Yeah, anybody can do that, but the key is. The better the image is coming out of the camera or the telescope, automatic telescope like that, the less work you have to do in PixInsight and Photoshop. My, my best images have required the least amount of processing. And well, I, uh, I was very pleased with how well it came out. It was, yeah. it was like, wow, this, this really looked that my next yeah. goal is Tadpole. Yeah, it kind of looked um, about the same, better actually, I'm going to say, than the image I took with my Sony um, A7 camera and my little 72 millimeter refractor out at Lee. It's like an hour and a half or something like that. And it, just the nebulosity around the galaxy uh, was quite amazing, I thought. And the aggravating uh, pixelated background is something that could easily be dealt with with a noise <laughs> a reduction. A lot of I that think. is that sophisticated back illuminated sensor. Yeah, um, and, and if you're uh, loading it into Photoshop to um, do some enhancing, you could even like mask around the galaxy. <laughs> and, yeah, but you could mask around the galaxy really get rid of the stuff and then superimpose the layers and nobody knows what the heck you did unless you tell them. No, I know. Would even know. That's what I see. I see all these things as like, wow, how did they back get that background to be pitch black like that? And then they say down at the bottom, um, after stacking, I use PixInsight. I'm like, yeah. oh, that's right. I saw well, that's them do Terminator. that. <laughs> yeah, that, that's totally yeah. cheating yeah. because when a normal person enhances any deep sky image and you want to get the most out of your galaxy it's going to like over process stars and everything and that will destroy the image so for pix insight to separate the stars from the nebula that's like that's not even fair i know but <laughs> you too can do that if you pay 300 bucks 
<laughs> plus, all it... plus the add-ons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah. So when, when you see Pix Insight now, you, you, there was a Fermilab astronomer who did a um, session a webinar on what he did to process uh, some of the images he took with these gigantic telescopes. And he's taken little, like all the blue out of a nebula, making a layer out of that and super processing that and then overlaying it. You don't even know what the heck people are doing. The important thing is no one is snapping one shot and that's that's what they're showing you. It's like I was tens of hours of integration on all these different channels and your thing, I guess, was only 10 second minutes. images over 90 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so very um, simple. Yeah. Yeah. And I was I was watching TV the whole time. That's, I that's just the best way to do it. Go, wow, does that look good? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that that's the best way to do more. it. It'll really drive the hardcore astronomers that did film astrophotography crazy. They'll be That's blowing right. blood vessels hey, I, would say, I would say yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, Especially and, one and here's, guy. Here's like yeah. here's like a, a non a non biased uh, train of thought. Okay, so you have the generation that a lot of us came out of the film, right? Where you had to work, in, and you had to learn your art, and you had to learn that stuff, and and make all kinds of changes. Uh, you didn't have anything backing you up. You had an ATM book, but the photography, I mean, it was all word of mouth type thing, right? And you could say the same thing about observing. Um, in the, probably the biggest amateur telescopes around that time were like eight inch. If you have it at 10 or 12, you were like a person with a, an 18 inch now, okay? And the same thing about the go-to. We had to learn the sky with setting circles and all this kind of stuff. So, you know, you're at a, a, a time in our generation now where now you have all this other stuff. So my thought was, okay, at the time with imaging versus observing, there was like a crossroads. The imaging became so available that observing took the back seat. Observing takes work and time and effort. It makes it a little bit easier to go to but you still have to learn how to observe. With the imaging, when I went to the uh, to the digital with the CCD, I had to learn everything from scratch. I didn't know I didn't know anything about anything, and so it took a long time for me to learn that craft. Well, now this next generation leapfrog that. I personally enjoy sitting out by the telescope, looking at the computer, watching the trackings. Uh, how it's tracking, um, watching as the five minute subs come up, making sure everything tracks right. And so that's part of the hobby that I enjoy. And I'm not saying anything against being able to sit in your house and watching that stuff, but part of it to me is being out there and doing it. Okay. And, there's, and then I have nothing against any of these other things. And the same thing with observing is that. I missed observing, so I ended up buying uh, Jim Griffin's 15-inch uh, Dob. So I went back to basic observing, where I had to find stuff in the sky again. And so, you know, you're kind of like, you want to inspire people to take up the hobby. But, you know, it's like when I, Herman and I went to one of those imaging conferences 10 years ago, and people were taking, you know, 40 hours of processing time on the computer to get and in Photoshop and the layers and all this other stuff. And it's like, well, you know, I like to do the real physical part of the hobby versus sitting at a computer. And so you, you have this balance and it depends what you want out of it. And I would say the same thing about these smart telescopes. If, if I buy one, I'm going to get into one of these things like the Unistar, Unistellar thing and, and uh, use it that way. Um, just as that kind of tool. But Greg, I, I agree with what you're saying about the overprocessing of images. And Jeff Benuzzi and I talked about this a long time ago. How do you know what's real when when you process it? Okay, and that was at the infancy of the CCD stuff. You know, where it was just starting to hit the our our uh, level. Um, I mean, you could take it as far as you want, and like Mark C says the same thing. He's got a one shot color, and he spends about 
10 minutes on processing and that's it. You know, this is what I took. That's, that's why I, I never got it. into the imaging portion of it, Mark, uh, because right. the same thing. I mean, it, it does it too good to be real. It's not what you see through the eyepiece. And I use that AIP for Windows until it doesn't work anymore. And they programmed that. They they built that so that you got real colors when you if you did it right. This was the real color of the nebula that you took. It wasn't exaggerated. And you, when you the information was there, you just needed to stretch the image enough to present it. But uh, you know. It's what you want to get out of it, uh, the whole thing. So that's why I enjoyed the uh, Mellon camp. You, right. you, I got to see something on my screen. I, I think I, the longest image I ever took was like a maybe a three minute exposure with the uh, Mellon camp. And right there on the screen, there was a beautiful image in color and everything like that. And it required no, uh, post-processing, nothing like that. I One of the things that I would never do is I, I would never even consider bringing a computer out in the field. It's like if I can't, if I can't get the image or see it uh, and I have to have a computer to do it, uh, that's not for me. And no. that's that like the, the revolution of... imagers that way. It's exactly, so yes. Yeah. And the right, revolution you, yeah. imager was even simpler uh, to operate than the Mellencam. Mellencam, because uh, I've got both, the Revolution and the Mellencam. Mellencam Extreme, uh, the images are better, okay, than the Revolution Imager, but the Revolution Imager was simpler to operate. Yeah, that's what got me started was the Revolution Imager. I agree with you, Jeff. Yep. Yeah, it's simpler to operate. And uh, that's why I I just recently bought one of these C-Star 50s. That's why I'm sitting here listening to you guys talk about it. I have very little time behind it yet because I haven't had time to do anything and the weather hasn't uh, cooperated. <laughs> but uh, I did get an sure, incredible huh? picture of the uh, nearly full moon with it. And I got... Uh, a picture of Jupiter, its moons. Uh, that's what I was after to see if I can get the moons, and I was able to do that. And uh, that's about all I've done with the Sea Star so far. Well, apparently, you just set it up and go inside and let it do its thing. <laughs> No, I still sit phone. out. I still sit out with the thing. I don't want to leave it out in the cold by itself. But I can go to my screen room where I've got a heater. <laughs> I, I was um, I was doing back in the icy week and a half of January. Um, I had it out there and I had it plugged into one of my wall outlets and my on my deck, or one of the outlets on my deck, and because I knew the battery wouldn't run at that level once it got cold enough and uh, I had the, the dew heater on and it, it worked for about an hour and a half. And he, but even with the dew heater on at that, like it was like zero um, eventually the, the lens just became opaque. Right. I mean, he just started, just started telling me time after time, this is not a viable image, you know, blah, blah, blah. All that time. I went out and I looked at it. I'm like, Oh, I can't see past the surface of the lens. So, <laughs> well, what's so the operating dead. temperature for for the C Star? Well, the battery is that the the battery runs the operating temperature, and that's that's um, they say minus fourteen C, which is like around fifteen degrees, but it'll run much colder than that. You just have to have it plugged in, and so once it's plugged, it starts running off of the off of the cable, the USB cable, instead of off of the battery. Won't the cold damage the battery? It did not, no. Well, no. we'll find out in uh, six months or yeah, so. Yeah, we'll find out in a couple of years. But the battery is replaceable on the C S50. Oh, okay. I uh, have that's an a, idea. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, 
so, sorry, Bob. Um, so the images on the C-Star, is it saved on a, um, a little card, a SD card or something? How, how do you get the images from the C-Star to your computer to process them, if you were so inclined? USB cable. Yeah, just plug it in and mount it as a drive yeah. on your PC. USB has, 3. It has about okay. 56 gigs of available storage. Mm -hmm. Or I should say usable. It's 64 gigs total. You have about 56 gigs of usable storage on it. All right. Yeah, I, I um, just like if I'm doing a lot of uh, observing, I just drag the whole thing onto my uh, laptop's hard drive. And when it gets to the point where it says, this all has the same name. Do you want to copy it? I click no, and I'm done. It's USB-C 3, or USB 3, so it's pretty fast. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. This uh, We're about an hour and a half in, and... Uh, if you like, you know, we can end it here. I'll upload the recording. And I learned a lot tonight about uh, the different types of uh, smart cameras. And I will keep you guys informed with my contacts there at uh, AAVSO with any um, software upgrades for the, or inter integration upgrades with the C-Star in the downloading programs there too. And, um, I'm going to look into the Unistellar uh, citizens uh, science thing too. So yeah, th that's very well organized. So they will give you the coordinates and everything else and the timing, because basically you may be checking an asteroid occultation right. or something like that. But everybody, wherever it is in the United States or the world, they're all together. All right. Um, and it's, so it's coordinated pretty close. Yeah, because after a while, you can only take like 30 pictures of them, 42, before you get tired of doing that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Just a little joke. Um, anyway, thanks, everybody. And uh, let me know whenever you want to have another one of these Zoom meetings. And one more question. Who's going to be out at uh, Sycamore Friday? And if you are, are you going to bring your C star or whatever? Yeah, I'm going to bring the C star with me. Okay. And I'm and if it's not cloudy, I'm going to bring um, my um, Celestron eight too. Okay, it's supposed to be nice out Friday. Uh, the weather has changed quite a bit to uh, clear and above freezing Friday night, which would be great. That would be excellent. Okay, well, I'll be there about 6.30 and then give the talk and we'll have observing at uh, 8 o'clock or so. Great. All right, thanks, everybody. Let me stop recording. Thanks for all the info, guys. Thank you, Mark. Yep. Good night.